All right, this is Josh T. Franco interviewing Wendy Red Star at her home in Portland, Oregon on July 28th, uh, 2020 for the Smithsonian Institution Archives of American Art Pandemic Project. Uh, so Wendy, thanks for taking some time to talk to us, talk to me for the archives. And yeah, this project is just um, a way to check in and create a record for the impact of this, the things happening this year on American artists. So really, how have you been since March is the first question. Well, thank you for having me. And this is a highlight, especially during this time, just to have access to talk um, to people, especially when you're in such isolation. Um, so since March, uh, you know, I've been self-employed as an artist uh, since 2016. So one of the tools that I have that I think has been really great for um, the situation that we're in right now with the pandemic is like dealing with the unknown. Mm -hmm. um, because um, the way that I've sort of positioned myself with um, my career is I'm never quite knowing when an opportunity is going to come. And uh, so I've sort of, have learned to kind of deal with that really uncomfortable feeling. So it's interesting. I feel like, you know, with my family, my sister and stuff, there's, they're kind of now feeling what I've felt since like 2016 with this unknown. So there's, so there's definitely that, but it, um, surprisingly, it's been a really wonderful time for me to reflect and think about how I was working um, before the pandemic and and I almost liken it to a little bit of an abusive relationship with my art career where I was just going all the time relentlessly traveling doing one project from the next and really working out of this sort of fear that I didn't quite recognize until like all of those things kind of shifted um, got postponed canceled disappeared and um so I'm really just kind of spending my time like analyzing like how you know how things are going to change for me um and how i want to approach you know my my career and my practice going forward especially in, in this time where i'm not doing I, my uh career path isn't working the same that it, it originally was yeah before. That raises two questions for me. One is about travel, because you're not the first artist to be, kind of be relieved that a lot of travel has stopped, most travel has stopped. Um, but the thing that's replaced it is like, that. normally we would travel to do an oral history in person, now we're doing them on Zoom. So how have you, have you been enjoying this like Zoom ecology we have now, or is it tricky? How do you do studio visits this way if you've done them? Um. I feel it's like it's turned me into a performance artist. So it feels <laughs> yeah. very performative to me in a way um, where I'm like making sure my environment looks pleasant <laughs> in the background. And, um, y you know, I, I sustain myself a lot through doing lectures, um, going to different universities or institutions to do lectures. Mm -hmm. And I realized with Zoom, doing lectures is completely different. And I'll have to shift my old like PowerPoint strategy where I really fed off the cues from a live crowd. And that's pretty much absent with um, doing a Zoom lecture. Uh, so yeah, so the, a lot of things have sort of switched up, but I also think this is kind of wonderful. I mean, I, I, it's almost in a way, you know, like I can reach more places virtually and it will be less wear and tear on me mentally and physically. Um, I just have to um, harness it a little bit better, make it more engaging. Yeah, I'd love to know like tips you've learned to do that. And I also, if you just for the record, if you can name some of those events that have been either canceled or postponed that you were looking forward to this year. So I was really looking forward to an, a solo exhibition at the Jocelyn Museum that was yeah. going to open in uh, June. And that has been postponed to 2021. And that's so in still, Omaha, right? Yeah, Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah, so that's museum. still happening. I'm, it's like a deep uh, research project on uh, the Indian Congress, which happened in 1898 in, in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. And in a way, I'm actually kind of think it's 
good that it got postponed because it gives me, a, allows me more time to really kind of um, go deeper into the research. Um, I had scheduled to go to the, the Welling Museum in Clinton, I believe it's Clinton, New York. Mm -hmm. um, I was in a group show there and I was scheduled to do a workshop and some lectures. Um, and originally that, the travel and everything was set and they canceled that. Um, it was up in the air and then they decided to do some Instagram live lectures, which I never done Instagram live before. <laughs> Um, and so that was really wonderful. And they paid me the full fee, which was oh, very generous right. of them. Um, so yeah, it's like things got canceled, but then I really feel like the institutions, at least the ones that I've been working with have really kind of stepped up to brainstorm, like how to navigate, um, like moving forward yeah, virtually. That's great. Um, what about your studio? Some artists, you know, their studios are in buildings that they couldn't access for the last few months or, you know, just for different reasons. Has this changed access to your studio or where you make work? Not at all. I've always worked from home. Uh -huh. um, so I, I have access <laughs> to Good. my materials. Um, so that hasn't changed. Um, that hasn't changed at all. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you hear that? No. Okay, good. <laughs> that was my uh, uh, email coming in. I turned it off. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry I know. about that. <laughs> yeah, the ding. I actually didn't hear it. Oh, hopefully. I think I turned mine off. Um, yeah, so, you know, the other thing, uh, artists are very media savvy, media observant people, and we've been asking um, what they're observing, what's missing in kind of mainstream accounts of things that are happening, either COVID or protests around you know, the murder of George Floyd and racism. Um, yeah, so what are you seeing and what are you not seeing? You know, it's, it's so interesting. I, um, my father, he's um, struggling a lot. He's going to be 79 in a couple weeks, but he has a lot of autoimmune issues. Um, and he's generally kind of uh, nearing towards the end of his life. So um, I've been really spending my time hardcore isolating so that I can like relieve my mom of her caretaking duties for a couple of weeks. So I just came back from the mm -hmm. reservation, but it's been really fascinating to go back to Montana where the Crow Indian reservation is located and to talk to my father um, and you know, I say, well, how do you think, how do you think us crows are going to get through this? Do you think we'll, um, we'll really feel it uh, economically? And I think we will, but he was like, no, we've always been living like in this like hor in horrible economics, you know? So I think like we're well equipped for getting through that, um, which is like devastating to hear, um, but, but uh, you know, painfully true, but also like that's, we're so resilient as a people. But my great fear is, um, this is what I'm, I'm feeling, especially when you, and we're actually, um, COVID is really um, affecting the Crow community. That's where mm -hmm. the high numbers are in the counties where the reservation is, but also thinking about like the Navajo Nation. Um, my dad, his first language is Crow. Um, and that's it for me, that he, that generation, his generation, there's maybe one generation above him, um, but hardly any. If they get it, that's it. That's a whole like knowledge base gone. And then I just think about my daughter, like, oh, I'm her source for crow culture. <laughs> and I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And I, I, uh, that's what I feel like is missing in, in, you know, the conversations around the pandemic and how it's affecting indigenous people is that in the Navajo Nation, most of the elderly folks of my dad's generation or the generation above him, they only speak uh, mm. Diné, you know, so uh, that's it. If we wipe them out, that's it for us, you know, for, for my generation. And then we're the knowledge keepers and um, so that, that's what I'm constantly thinking about when I'm taking care of him and just really trying to soak up as much as I can. But it just, it just seems like what a shame that would be to be cut off because of 
you know, the way that the US government has uh, um, not like been proactive of getting a handle on the pandemic. Do you feel like you have peers in your generation who are thinking about this also? No, I'm in, in, in a way, sometimes it's disappointing when I go to the reservation and I have my own cousins like blatantly just pop in the house and we're trying to tell them, you know, like, mm. really, like, this is it for us, you know, um, is that elderly generation. And, and, you know, my generation still really depends on um, my dad's generation for, for, mm. for everything still. So uh, it's like, I, I wish it would be taken more seriously back home too. And I think that I can't say what's happening on the Navajo reservation but if it's anything like mine I think there's some of that too where it's just like um, the information coming from the government hasn't been take this seriously wear a mask like uh, it yeah. hasn't trickled down are they providing information in Diné I don't know I don't know that yeah. seems like an important thing yeah. to do yeah. but I, I just I do feel like just from my reservation thinking about the other reservations I would say that it's a similar situation, mm. for sure. Yeah. Um, are you finding yourself thinking about imagining new artworks that have this kind of content directly involved, or is it just creating more space for you to keep working? I mean, the isolation does have that kind of silver lining of time to be in your workspace. Yeah, I, you know, for me, it's not like directly like about like, the pan the pandemic itself, but I think it relates in that I am piecing together these historical timelines. You know that mm -hmm. that is the history and the culture of the generation of my father. That when he goes, that's gone. You know, especially with the the language. I don't speak Crow. I know several words and things like that, but um, so much of the perspective is within the language, and for mm -hmm. uh, that to be gone. So really accessing that generation and their knowledge to to piece together these historical timelines is what i'm focusing on and i think that very much relates to the pandemic and the decimation that it will cause yeah. so it's not outright like this is about <laughs> yeah the pandemic but um i think it's kind of like what you're doing now like where you're sort of archiving or sending information about the 1818 uh flu um i'm just trying to i'm just trying to be there to archive and and yeah. hold hold that history yeah um you know you're also situated in portland there's a lot going on in portland so yes. just, what are you observing as a resident there oh my gosh it's um in a way i'm so proud i'm like really proud that it's proactive because uh, the city is always in the media about being the white widest city so mm. And it's great that the white people are doing the work. That's how I feel like they're continuing to protest because uh, they're, I think that's what they should be doing. Um, so I think that's really wonderful. And just even driving to go get groceries or whatever, people um, not just downtown, but um, in the neighborhoods are having their own little um, protests like on the corners with Black Lives Matter, um, uh, posters and things like that so to me it just feels like very vibrant and there's a statue of uh, I think George Washington that I was always bothered by <laughs> you know? that was sort of hanging out and then uh, one week I went by and it was toppled over and I was like whoa yeah. and now I've driven by and there's like a bouquet of flowers there on the pedestal but it, it's just kind of fascinating because before I was just like um sort of like i never really liked that statue but i would drive by it thinking nothing would ever come of it i never even thought to take it down you know so yeah. when they took it down and now there's no statue there and a bouquet of flowers it's like it's like wild um, yeah. but I, I like it if you were asked as a you know a known artist who lives in portland to to create the replacement for a public sculpture like that would you accept? And if you did, what, what do you think you would create? You know, that's what I was sort of thinking. Um, 
and I was thinking, man, I would like to make a, a miniature or something that would go on there, not like these huge things. <laughs> but you have to get really close to to see. Yeah, something. and I was like, oh, maybe it would be like a dwelling of some sort, or I was even, you know, I'm obsessed with horses, so it's like maybe <laughs> my take on like a horse sculpture or something, but I, I really like this idea of like not making a huge hmm. uh, statue, but something kind of small <laughs> that you'd yeah. have to kind of go up to, and I think Part of that is because that bouquet is so tiny on there, mm -hmm. the bouquet of flowers. That's kind of brilliant in itself to have that there. Um, so yeah, I think I, I probably would do something, but it would be definitely uh, something tiny. Yeah, I imagine <laughs> the colors, you know, small bouquet is a small object, but the colors make it visually kind of. Yeah, like, yeah. it's, it's um, and they're actually kind of dying right now too. So that's also interesting to see that happening. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the archives, we can reasonably expect to be around for a long time and our content, what we create and preserve to be around. So I've been asking artists, um, speaking to artists in a hundred years to what would you, what do you think they need to know about being an American artist in 2020? I love that it's a shift. It's a big shift that's happening and mm -hmm. I feel it and I feel like, um, there's no way around it. Like people have to contend with it. Everyone actually has to contend with it in some, some way. And that's, um, to me, progression. And I'm excited about it. I'm excited about all the movement that's happening, even, even if um, the movement is violent at times. I think, I think it's the only way that the shift can happen. You know, we're just, we're, we're, we have nowhere to go and we're confronted with it. So I think mm -hmm. that's what I think this time is about. Great movement and shift and change in a direction that I hope is favorable to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> people of color um, mm -hmm. and moving that forward. So that's what I think. I think this, that's what will be looked upon this mm. year. Yeah, um, you're such an efficient responder, Wendy, it's great. Oh, uh, <laughs> do we have, you know, one thing that seems, it's changed for me, it seems to change for a lot of people is a relationship to social media. So have, oh. and, um, I've enjoyed following your Instagram. Has that, and I, I, I don't know if I was more. following it so closely before. So I'm like, is this new? Is it all this, the way you're using it different? The I, way you need I, it different? I fear it. You know what I fear? I just, uh, it's hard for me when, because as you being an archivist, we're not doing things on the surface. Like if, uh, if some, if an image flashes up, uh, social media has bred this breeding ground to just be very reactionary. Like there's a great example of this, uh, protester riding a horse in Chicago, this black man on this beautiful paint horse. Mm. And there was uh, stuff going around about how this uh, black protester stole this police, co uh, police horse and mm. was riding it through town. Then like a few weeks later, it came out, no, that's his horse. And he owns a few horses and uh, he didn't steal. And like he was getting all this like death threats and things like that. And that's the thing that really frightens me about where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. It's that um, people don't do or take the time to digest information. They just are reacting left and right. Yeah. And especially now with the protests and the pandemic, it's even a shorter fuse. And so I, I just feel like to me, um, I tr it's, in a way, it's like people are saying, don't be silent. But I think the situation that we're in right now, it's a breeding ground where it's, it, it, it does cause silence in some, some ways because people are so reactionary. Mm -hmm. So I don't wanna be silent. I'm, I'm not saying be silent, but I do think that it's important um, for me when I post, um, I'm always looking for an empathetic sort of route and an end for people who are viewing my social media. Mm -hmm. um, 
because I want to know the full story. And so I'm, I'm not ever really going to post things that are, are just going to catch an eye. Um, and you'll have, there's something that you'll have to slowly digest. And it's, o it's always been that way for me, I think, and more so now. Um, so yeah, I, I think text in your work is one device you use to slow down looking because you have to read, you have to get it yes. and read. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And so, and I, and I actually have a hard time following those people who are so like, uh, this is wrong and this is right, black and white things. Because mm -hmm. I know it's so much more complex and so much more nuanced. And I do kind of love those stories that come out two weeks later that, no, this guy, <laughs> this guy has three awesome horses. And yeah. he was out there with his paint and uh, protesting. And um, there was a lovely um, article. I don't know. I can't remember which outlet it came out him like hugging and kissing his horse and like I was like that's such a better story <laughs> than sort of like he stole this horse and was like out there like um no it's so much deeper he's part of yeah. that community and mm -hmm. uh, um he's he has his horses and he lives in Chicago and the, there's so much more there yeah I'm always looking for that yeah um, that's great. Do you have any that's, last that's words? after you complimented me for being really efficient in my, uh, <laughs> my responses. I feel like that went like all over the place. That's great. <laughs> Do you have any last words for the record uh, about this year being, being Wendy, being an artist in 2020, yeah. being a mother? Uh, I just want to say like um, my income has shifted dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, to like really shift it. So that's something economically that I've noticed this year. And luckily last year, I was able to save up a year's worth of emergency fund. Good. And so for me, where I've been finding comfort, I am um, a visiting teacher for Chautauqua Art Institute. Mm. And I've been meeting with students and even doing a little workshop. And where I'm finding the most comfort is talking to artists about various action plans on how to sustain themselves during this time or how to confront like, or find comfort in sort of the unknown, because I need that too. Yeah. And so um, for me, like I said, in the beginning of this interview, I'm really finding this time to be a great time to reflect, especially on the old ways. Didn't you feel like when you were doing all that travel that it was a bit like out of control, like that we could move our bodies all over? Yeah. Well, and there's, you know, as so a, it, there's an interesting branch in art history in the last few years too about observing the relationship between the like the explosion of the jet age in like the 60s when it, people started being able to just jump on planes and the development of the art world and um it's really good to have that scholarship around now because it's a way to digest something that now has ceased <laughs> and like yeah and it, it is crazy it's yeah it's just it's not it wasn't sustainable clearly and we're feeling it's not spiritually sustainable it's certainly not environmentally sustainable yeah uh, yeah so i just really felt that it's like whoa my body was in this state and then mm. the next <laughs> day it was yeah. in this and then like two days later it's over here and it was just yeah. it seemed like to happen so quickly too yeah. uh, over the last five or six years and mm. it, it it got to the point for me where i was like this doesn't feel right like the wheels of the train or i, I don't know yeah. like the car are gonna like spin off <laughs> at some point except it seems like that happened to the whole world. Yeah. The whole world was like stopped and came to a screeching halt. So yeah, for me, it's about reevaluating and thinking of ways to stay connected, but in a more sustainable fashion. So it's really brilliant that yeah. this interview is happening and we are doing those things. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great. thank you. Great.